So as we begin our lesson here this morning, I want to talk to you for a little bit about how to recognize a lie. How is it that we can understand when we're being presented with something that is just not true? Now, I know the, the picture on the screen is a departure from my normal, uh, but I couldn't resist uh, putting that piece of clip art up there because it speaks, uh, speaks so well to what I want to talk about here today. Now sometimes the, the lie is so blatant right in front of us, but we've been told that it's, that it's not, that not, not the case, that it is the truth. Sometimes something is just so blatant, but we just can't see it because of the obstacles that we perhaps have put in the way. And this is this is uh, true for for all of mankind, uh, not just not just Christians. But as we think back to our time, perhaps if you're sitting here today and you are not yet a Christian, I'm speaking to you uh, most loudly because I want you to look around you and see, you know, who is telling you the truth. And as I often mention, and I hope you take me up on this uh, on this. Uh, this desire of mine that you go and make sure that the things that I'm telling you are the truth. As it was mentioned in the Bible study, uh, one of the brethren mentioned during the Bible study that the thing that caught his eye and, and, and caused him to understand the truth was that when, when he was a young man, someone took him off to the side and studied the scriptures with him. And when he had a question, he was able to point to a Bible answer for that question. And if we can do that, we can we can lay aside all of the things that the world will try to teach us and uh, all the confusion that is being sown out in the world. So as we think about uh, how to recognize a lie, let's turn to Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12 verse 19 says, Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And if you stop and think on that for just a moment, the, the wisdom that we find in these short little statements in Proverbs is, is just uh, mind-blowing sometimes. But as we just think about this statement, you know, the truth will endure. The truth is always going to be the truth. The truth will be found to be the truth given, given enough time and consideration. You can't get around it. There is no way to uh, put the truth down forever. The, the truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Lies, they just won't last forever. You'll come to understand when you've been lied to. Perhaps you can think back to a time when someone told you something that wasn't true. And it may have taken years to come to the, the knowledge of it, but you eventually realize that, you know what, that, that was not true. But if something is true, it will continue to be true for eternity. Something to, to, to wrap our minds around as we think about how we can recognize a lie. And before we get into the meat of the lesson about how to recognize a lie, I want to just reiterate something that you probably already know, is that God cannot lie. You know, first things first. Hebrews 6 at verse 17, if you turn with me there, Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 17, says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that they by two immutable things, in which is it, impo it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now God cannot lie to us. He, it is a, outside of his nature. The things that God has told us through his word, they are truth. And if you spend enough time looking into the truth and comparing it to the things that you hear otherwise from the world and from men and from from those that would cause confusion, 
in your life. When you compare the word of God to those things, you can understand the truth for what it is. And realizing that if you've ever been lied to, if you've ever been in a situation where, where you feel someone has told you uh, something that wasn't true, perhaps even in the religious world, realize that that wasn't from God. Even though a person may have been standing on a podium, even though a person might have had uh, you know, all of the force of some human institution behind him or her, uh, it is not God that lied to you. We can't project onto God those things that men do. You know, when, when, when evil things happen, when things happen to people and it's just absolutely horrific, if, some, if someone is brutally murdered in cold blood, it is not from God. God didn't make that to happen. It is from evil thoughts and evil desires in men's minds that those things happen. In Romans 3, starting at verse 3, it says, For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but let every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. You know, we have to be comfortable with the idea of letting God be true. We have to set forth in our minds that God is true. And even if someone brings to us something that, that causes us to doubt, God is true. And we need to snap our minds back into that idea and be comfortable with that. And then study his word to find out and to be fully convinced within your own heart that God is true. Psalm 119 at verse 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Now that's another comforting thought and a scary thought at the same time. The entirety of the word of God is truth, and you can trust it. You can take it to the bank, as people say in, in common language. But also, the latter part of that statement, your righteous judgments endure forever. That's a scary thing. Because we're going to be judged by the word. We're going to be judged by that truth that is immovable. We're going to be judged by that truth that will not change. And if that's the case, then we had better come to understand what is the truth and what is a lie so that we can align ourselves properly. Hebrews 11 at verse 1 speaks of faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The, I believe the King James says the evidence of things not seen. Faith is crucial to this that we're looking at here today. In order to recognize what a lie is, you have to have faith that the Lord is true and to look into his word, to spend enough time with it to understand what his will is for you, to understand the things that he's set forth as truth that can be clearly seen if we just try a little bit. Faith is at the, at the core of this thing that we're, we're talking about here today. So as we continue to look at how to recognize a lie, how to see it for what it is, we want to pick it apart and kind of look at the structure of a lie. Now as I'm looking at this, you are not supposed to see the bottom left-hand corner of that screen yet, those, those couple of bullet points. So just disregard those for now, and we'll come to those later. Uh, evidently, I didn't put that... Uh, put those animations in there properly. But I want to first, before we get down to those bullet points, I want to look at some of the examples that we have in Scripture of lies that have been told. Now let's go to Eve and the serpent in Genesis 
chapter 3. Uh, we, we are undoubtedly somewhat familiar with that, probably very familiar with Genesis chapter 3. But uh, as we, we look at Genesis chapter 3 in the beginning there, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So there we have the beginning of that account of how that lie began in the garden. They were lied to. Eve was lied to, and she took it for what it was. Now I want you to keep that, that, that thought in your mind, and I want to go through hopefully... Hopefully this order makes sense to you. We're going to go now forward to Genesis chapter 39. And uh, we're going to look at another example of lies that were told to people. And in Genesis chapter 39, we find ourselves looking into the account of Potiphar's wife. And chapter 39, the book of Genesis, verse 10 It says, so as it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. So this, as you know, Potiphar's wife desired that Joseph were to lie with with her and engage in something that is reserved for the marriage bed. But it happened about this time in verse 11 when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me. And fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. And then as we continue to look down in verse 20, then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. So we see a lie. On, on, on the part of Potiphar's wife, having lied about what happened in this situation. And then one more, one more for our consideration, and then, we'll, and then we'll think about these things a little bit more. Let's go over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. We, uh, at the beginning of the chapter, in verse 1, it says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So as we as we look at as we look at this, we see, as you see in the the image to the right of of the bullet points there, that a half truth plus a half truth equals a whole lie. We see in these examples, uh, what I hope to bring out is that there is a kernel of truth involved in each of these accounts. Maybe a couple of kernels in in, in some cases. And this is is true in just about every situation you can think of where there's deception at hand. 
They're founded on a kernel of truth. That's what makes them believable. And because of that foundation of truth, then the person who is being deceitful can cast some doubt. And, you know, as we, as we look at the account here uh, in, in Acts, let's go back to Acts chapter 4. And we see the context there. And we understand the first century church, as they came together, there were some people there that had needs. And the people uh, came together, and they sold the things that they had, and they brought the, the proceeds forth. And they, as we, uh, we read there in verse 34, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone has need. So as we see there, there was something going on and then uh, where people were selling their lands and bringing the money together to help everybody. And Ananias and Sapphira wanted to be a part of that. And I can imagine that, you know, that they, they wanted to be a part of that and they had maybe some good intentions, but somewhere in the back of their mind after they had decided they're going to join in with this, with this uh, action that they had those second thoughts. A little bit of greed maybe set in or whatever. And so then they had that doubt about what they were going to do. And then they, they set forth and continued to, to, to lie. They, what they said when they brought the money forward, you know, they, they had a, there was a kernel of truth there because they had sold the land. But that doubt came in, and then they perpetuated the falsehood. So you read on, you, you find out that, that his wife also did the very same thing. She continued the lie. And they tried to play it off as, as if nothing happened. Now, in this particular instance, the example is cut short because they were struck dead. And they didn't have much of a chance to continue the lie out and to normalize it and to make it seem like nothing had happened. But if we go back to the others, if we go back to Potiphar's wife, going back to the book of Genesis, we'll work backwards up through our, our bullet points here. So Genesis chapter 39 again. I should have marked it so that I could turn to it quickly. But in Genesis chapter 39, as we go back and look at, look at the account that we were looking at, and what we have in verse 14 is that the doubt is being cast. She called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, He has brought, a, brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. There is that doubt. And then we move on, and in verse 15, she mentions that he left his garment with her. Well, that's true enough, but that's not the, to the whole truth, is it? There's a kernel of truth there, yes. His garment remained behind, when he left. And so I guess you can say that he left it there with her, but the, the actions that preceded that were not as she, as she stated. So she's using that, that little bit of truth to perpetuate, to build a lie, and to continue with it. They're casting doubt in, in the other people in the household's minds, and then eventually in her husband's mind. Now, Joseph undoubtedly would have been one that <clears throat> was known. I mean, he, was, he came to be trusted uh, because of his character. And later on, as we continue to learn about Joseph, if you read on, uh, his character and the, the favor of the Lord continued to make him prosper. As in the end of, of Genesis 39, in verse 23, uh, it says, And the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So, it was noticeable that this was a guy that could be trusted. And I'm sure that it wasn't easy uh, to convince those that were uh, in the household that Joseph had done this thing, but the evidence was there. There was that half-truth that was stated. And that doubt then carried that forward, and she perpetuated the lie when her husband came home. And then, as far as we know, she continued to live on and as if nothing happened. You know, all of those parts that we're looking at here in these four bullet points, they feed on that doubt that was cast. 
because there's that kernel of truth and then there's that doubt that was cast, then that continues that snowball effect. And then we find, we find deception has taken place. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 and apply these bullet points to Genesis chapter 3. So as we, as we look here in, um, let's go to, to verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So there's that half truth there, that you will not surely die. Well, that's true enough. They weren't struck dead immediately. There's that, that, that half-truth that is being stated by, by the serpent. And then he perpetuates it and continues it along the way and says, your eyes will be opened and it will be like God, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. And that was something that just made that half-truth of, well, you're not really going to die, stick a little harder because there was that desire to know those things. It was that desire to be like God. And then going backwards a little bit in uh, verse 1, at the end of verse 1, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? There's some more doubt being cast, uh, even before the lie was brought forth. But he was paving the way there, casting doubt, causing, causing her to think. And then he brings forth that lie, and then he keeps on perpetuating it. And he has certainly uh, normalized the lie. If you look around us in the world today, as it has been ever since the fall of mankind in the garden, life has moved on and people have become desensitized to sin. They've become desensitized to lies. And sometimes they can't, they, they can't even tell the truth from a lie because they refuse to look back at the truth. They refuse to look into the word and to find out what the truth is. As we think in our own lives of the times that we've been lied to, was there a kernel of truth there? Was there some doubt cast that caused you to... to kind of be double-minded and think, oh, I wonder if that's true. That's a, that's a powerful tool in the hands of Satan. It's a powerful tool to cast that doubt and to cause us to, to wonder, I, is that really true? When we come into contact with our friends and our family and they say, oh, the Bible's just a, just a bunch of fairy tales. Why do you believe that? That casts some doubt. When the finger is pointed, you know, our, our children, when they, when they talk to their friends and, and they cast doubts in their minds, well, that's not really a bad thing to do. No one's, no one's going to see you. And why is that such a bad thing? You know, just think about all of the different ways this applies to us and how, how the falsehood continues to be perpetuated by mankind. And it becomes a normal part of our lives. As we it was mentioned in the, in the Bible study uh, time this morning, you know, if you look at the television commercials that, that we uh, see come across the, the airwaves now, uh, there are some things in there that absolutely wouldn't have been accepted just a few years ago. They would have been thought to be vulgar. But here they are in our everyday lives. When we, when we bring those things into our homes. And it, it, does its, it does its job. It works in the minds of those that, uh, that are open to that. We have to be strong against those things. And we have to be able to understand when we're being lied to. And there's more to this story, of course. We can talk longer about how to pick out those that are lying to us. But this is, this is probably enough for now. We can each then go back and continue to study in the scriptures and understand what the will of the Lord is. All the more as we, as we go through our lives. And we can be then a little bit more prepared 
to see a lie for what it is. In Colossians 2, let's read a few verses in Colossians 2 as we bring this lesson to a close. For what I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of, the, of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good to see your good order in the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And realizing that he has all authority. Realizing that his word is truth. Going back to what we talked about before we started to pick apart the structure of a lie. His word is truth and it, that truth will not change. That truth will be found out by those that seek to find it. We need to be sure, just as, just as these first century Christians needed to be sure, we, we also need to be sure that no one deludes us with plausible arguments. There's all kinds of arguments being made, and there's that kernel of truth in those lies that are being told in the world. There's that kernel of truth that makes it plausible. And then that doubt that increases that. And one of the, you know, as we send our children to school and they learn these philosophies and they, they learn these human traditions, these things of the world that are not according to Christ. Now, I'm not standing here telling you that you can't send your children to school. But we need to be sure that they aren't deluded with plausible arguments. Because as they go through life, and, and, and in today's world, it's starting younger and younger and younger that those plausible arguments are put out there. So that, so that their minds are confused. And the doubts are cast. They're being told half-truth after half-truth and quarter-truths and all these different kernels of truth are being put out there and then diluted with, with lies. And it's very powerful. And we need to not lose sight of just how powerful these things can be in our lives, but especially in our young people. We need to see to it that no one takes us captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits, of the world and not according to Christ. Understanding there in verse 9 that, that he is God. When he was on this earth, he was fully man and fully God. And he still is fully God. As we, as we take our steps through life, we need to make sure that we're not falling into a trap. But we are following after him because he has all rule and authority. You know, recognizing this lie is the first step. When we're being lied to, first thing we need to do is, is understand it. But then the question is, will you take the next step? Once you see it for what it is, and once you've been able to understand that you've been led down a path that is not leading to the Lord, that you've been led down a path that is going to be your destruction if something doesn't change, Will you have the fortitude to take that next step? To step outside of the plausible arguments. To step outside of the, the, the doubts that are cast by the world around us. Will we take that next step? 
Romans 1, starting at verse 20, says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We need to be sure that we aren't exchanging that truth of God for a lie. So, again, as we wind this lesson down, have we exchanged the truth of God? Are we living the lies that are being told in the world? You know, if you're standing here today, if you're sitting here today, and you have not put on Christ in baptism, I, I offer that invitation to you that you've heard a little bit of the word and if you believe that he is, if when you look into the word you come to un the understanding that he is the Christ and you're willing to confess him before men, you're willing to turn away from those things that separate you from the Lord, you're willing to take that step into the waters of baptism, then please don't wait another day. If you're sitting here today and you've done those things, but you found that the road has been difficult and doubts have been cast and perhaps you've allowed some lies to slip by and you've taken them for truth and you need the encouragement of the saints. And by all means, let it be known. Let it be known so that we might be able to help you and to pray for you and to work with you so that we can all be stronger so that we can all see the lies of Satan for what they are. That we might take hold of the truth and let those lies be behind us. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ today, then by all means, please come forward as we stand and sing.